Thank you.
So good morning. Everyone is very welcome this morning, if you're joining us online or if you are in the building. And yes, it's Mother's Day, and I hope all of us who can take the opportunity to recognize our mums today. Of course, not everyone will be or feel able to say thanks to their mum. If she's passed on, then I hope you can treasure her memory. And if you're not on good terms, then perhaps this is a good opportunity to reach out. And today is special in another way, as we'll be witnessing Jackson being baptized. And that will happen before the children leave for their activities so that everyone can see it and rejoice with him. And Pete will explain a bit more about why we do this in a little while. And later on, Graham will look at the next installment in our study in the book of Acts. Now, everything we do this morning revolves around Jesus. And we want to lift him high, acknowledging that we don't deserve the mercy or the grace that he offers us. In Psalm 9, it says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And so let's bring our worship with the help of music. And I invite you to stand as Gary and the band lead us as we do that. Come with trumpet sound 
please do have a seat. Many thanks, band. Now, allow me to highlight a number of things that are going on in the life of the church in addition to the regular activities in the newsletters. This is a home group week. If you're not already part of one, then please let me know at the end and I'll point you in the direction of Alistair Chalmers, who looks after the groups. On Saturday morning, a group of neighbours from around the church are meeting to do a spring clean of the street, including litter and leaf removal. Now, if you'd like to help do our bit, then please let me know at the end of the service. Also on Saturday, there is an actual baby shower in the upstairs hall for recent arrivals and for those about to arrive. And remember that the church weekender is on the 29th of April. Now, as Easter is approaching, a number of members have written some of the daily devotions to help us in the run-up. And Alistair has put these together and they'll be available in the foyer from next Sunday. And finally, I'd like to plug the return of the Praise Gathering Choir, which like many other things has had to have a break during lockdown restrictions. It involves hundreds of people from lots of different churches. Rehearsals are here in this church on Tuesday evenings after Easter and run up to the concerts in June in both Glasgow and in the Usher Hall here in Edinburgh, just down the road. So if you can sing, then do think about joining and do ask me if you want more information. Something special happens when you're singing as part of a group and when you're singing with three or four hundred other people, that just gets magnified. First night when I came into this church to rehearse, I was overwhelmed by singing beside 250, 300 voices. The sound is amazing. When else would you get the chance to sing on the stage in the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall, to sing in front of 2,000 people. It's an amazing opportunity. The rehearsals are amazing, but the concerts are, are certainly the highlight of the whole experience. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, my name's Peter. I'm the youth pastor here, and I'd like to invite all the boys and girls to come up here. Uh, just watch out for the lectern that's been moved there. But yeah, come up, boys and girls, if you can come up. And can anyone tell me, now there's a few reasons why today is special. I mean, it's been mentioned already. Can anyone tell me what's special about today? What's special about today? It's Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day. And can anyone see what I've brought with me? Oh, oh no. Oh, I've forgotten. Right. Um, Right, just talk amongst yourselves, okay? I'll be back in a second. Oh dear, where is it? Oh, here it is. Right. Right. Okay. All right, great, okay, right, fine, right. Okay. Okay, so yes, it's Mother's Day, and I've got some two fantastic presents, okay? So I've got the, does anyone know what these are? Do you know, where's, oh, I've lost the microphone now. Where did I put the microphone? There it is, right. Oh, just losing everything today. Do you know what these are? Who knows what these are? Flowers. They are, they're flowers. Okay, they're hyacinths. They're hyacinths, okay? And I've got... Right, who... Right, which one of you took... Which one of you took the chocolates? Who took the chocolates? Which one of you was it? Who was it? Him. Him? <laughs> who was it? Him! It was him. Does everyone agree? Yeah. Okay, because I didn't see it. Let me take this off. I didn't see it. 
I didn't see what happened, but you guys saw what happened. Okay, so you are, you are eyewitnesses to what happened. Yeah? yeah? yeah. You're eyewitnesses to what happened. Okay, so you guys are eyewitnesses to what happened. And you're willing to testify about what happened, yes? You're willing to give an eyewitness testimony to what happened. So if, if we went to court, you would be able to say to the judge or the jury, you would to say, what would you say? You say it was... What would you say? Him. You say, it was him. <laughs> so you would, you would give an eyewitness testimony as to what it was that happened. And what would you say exactly happened? You wouldn't say, oh, it was him. What actually happened? What, if you had to go to court and say what happened, what would you say happened? Um, Ian did it. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's Robert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but what would you say Robert did? What would you say he did? Stole the Maltesers. You would say, so that would be your eyewitness testimony. You would say, Robert stole the Maltesers. That's what you would say, okay? And we're thinking about testimony today because it's not just Mother's Day today. There's something else special happening today. What other thing is special happening today? There's a baptism happening today. And as part of a baptism, we always have a testimony. Okay, and we do that in different ways. Sometimes we do a, a question and answer thing. Sometimes uh, the person who's getting baptized, and it's Jackson that's getting baptized today, he's just going to tell us his testimony. Okay? And what is that? What does it mean when he says he's going to tell us his testimony? It means that he is an eyewitness to what God has done. Okay, so it's not like you guys, you witnessed what Robert did. Robert did something bad and you witnessed it. Jackson is a, an eyewitness to what God has done in his life. So he's going to give his testimony. He's going to tell us what God has done in his life. And by being baptized, that also is showing us that he is trusting in God and he's trusting in Jesus. And that, again, it's a testimony to tell everybody what God has done. Okay, and when Jackson goes down into the water and comes back up again, that will remind us of what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? How did Jesus go down and then back up again? Does any, can anyone think? Where did Jesus go down into? Where did he go? And then he came back up again. He went into a tomb and he rose again. He went into a tomb and rose again. He died and came back to life again. And in baptism, we see a picture of that. And Jackson, he's testifying to everybody that he is trusting in Jesus and that his old life has died and he's got new life in Jesus. And that's an amazing thing that we can celebrate together. We can celebrate this baptism, okay? And thank you to Robert for playing along with me, okay? I asked him to do that, okay? And he, he is going to give the Maltesers back, I hope. <laughs> okay, so like Fraser said... We're going to wait until after the baptism because it's exciting for you guys to see the baptism. You know that there's water under here, okay? We filled this tank last night and we heated it up a little bit as well. It's not too cold, I don't think. So after the baptism, Creation Roots will head through to Route 1 with Naomi and Alex. Kids Church will be upstairs with myself and Sheba. And in the embassy, the secondary age kids, you're going to do app chat which is after the service, you'll listen to the sermon. Uh, instead of going to room one, like we've been doing recently, we're going to go to the corner. Now, we used to call these the lounges, but I wasn't sure what we're calling it now, but I've just called it the corner. Uh, but this is what we used to do uh, with Embassy back before COVID. We used to just meet in the corner, so straight after the service, just meet in the corner to have a chat and to chat about the sermon and, and how, how you guys can apply it uh, to your lives. Okay, so let me just pray. Uh, and then we'll go back to our seats and uh, Jackson is going to come up and give his, his what? Testimony. Jackson's going to come up and give his testimony. So let's pray and then we'll get your seats and then you guys can, you know, come back a little bit closer when the baptism's happening as well. Okay. All right, let's pray. P-R-A-Y. Dear God, thank you for today. We thank you for Mother's Day. Lord, we thank you for all our mothers. Lord, and we thank you for this baptism that we're going to see today. And I thank you that many of us can testify 
to what you have done in our lives. Lord, and I pray if there's anybody here or anybody watching, Lord, if they don't know you, Lord, if they don't know Jesus, Lord, I pray that today um, the, the testimony that they see and hear, Lord, would help them to put their trust in you so they too would want to be baptized and to be able to tell others about what God has done in their lives. So I pray you'd help us all today, Lord, to celebrate, uh, to celebrate mothers, Lord, and to celebrate uh, Jackson's baptism. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi there, everyone. Uh, for those of you I haven't met yet, my name is uh, Jackson Tallinn. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student uh, studying ancient Greek and Latin uh, language and literature at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I'm a Canadian, uh, and I've lived most of my life uh, in a suburb of the city, Toronto. Um, being baptized seems like it's uh, been coming a long time for me. Uh, I remember having considered it uh, when I was 13 years old, and I'm now 22. Uh, but I feel that uh, along with the things that God has been leading me uh, into for the last year in, in particular, uh, that with his perfect timing, he's been saving it for this day all along. Uh, before I go into the tank today, I'll share a little bit of that story. Uh, so I was raised in a Christian family, uh, largely thanks to the examples of my two pairs of God-fearing grandparents. Uh, and it's such a special thing to know that I have family watching now, actually, uh, or who will see this later, uh, from across Canada, the United States, uh, and Scotland, uh, including my grandpa, who turns uh, a ripe old 86 years old yesterday. Uh, so happy birthday, grandpa. Um, now, I was always a sensitive and passionate child uh, with a taste for, for the intense and serious, uh, which perhaps explains my attraction to ancient Greek literature. Um, and I think partly as a result of this, uh, even during my nasty, disobedient phases, uh, whenever I did anything wrong and got told off for it, uh, it had a particularly deep impact on me and determined how I saw myself. Um, this especially influenced me as I grew older uh, and started to do things that I knew for myself were wrong. Um, and there was guilt growing in me. Uh, and I brought my characteristic intenseness and seriousness in sorting this guilt out. Um, as, as a result of this and other factors, I became more and more private uh, and alone inside uh, and more critical of myself and critical of others. Um, once I went into my teenage years, I began to analyze more of what I believed about God, uh, Jesus, and the Bible. Um, I think I've almost uh, always believed in God, but at the time, I, I didn't feel too sure. And any, at any ways, I wanted to, to build my reasoning from the ground up and not just to accept uh, what my parents taught me or what was familiar. Um, and as for Jesus, I thought I accepted his teachings as a moral teacher, uh, and I certainly recognized that I was sinful. Uh, but I didn't see what his being God and dying for us really meant. Uh, or if it ever really happened at all. Uh, and I also wasn't sure what parts of the Bible I should trust, if I could even trust any of it all, at all. Um, when I was maybe 16 years old, I took a book out of the library called Mere Christianity uh, by C.S. Lewis. Uh, and it didn't take long until I was feeling pretty intellectually convinced uh, by the claims of Christianity. Um, when I left home, I began to go to a church of my own, and I soon felt I could call myself a Christian with a bit more confidence. Uh, but in the deeper level of my heart, I still felt I wasn't um, good or holy enough uh, to really be a Christian. There was the old reminder that things were wrong at the core of my heart and my will and my mind, uh, and I thought I just wasn't trying hard enough to fix them. I would have to become more religious. Being, becoming a more committed Christian did so many good things for me. Uh, it put me in a lot of wonderful communities that I really badly needed uh, when I was a teenager and a young adult, uh, and gave me a stability under my feet in uncertain years. Uh, but in my heart, I, I knew I still wasn't as changed as I, as I should have been. Um, one moment, I would become incredibly judgmental, uh, and then the next moment, uh, devastatingly shaken by guilt. Um, one moment, I would be anxious and self-pitying, uh, and the next, arrogant and, and ridiculously vain, uh, just kind of going back and forth between these extremes. Um, and my hope for a happy life, uh, the things that I would constantly be thinking about, uh, and so that were really the gods of my life, uh, were often my, my dream career or my ideal persona uh, or my physical appearance or romantic relationship or many other things. 
God's work in me has been continual, but about a year ago, he started to show me things uh, that have allowed him to work much more in my heart, uh, bringing about changes there like I never would have expected. Uh, I began to acknowledge that things that I was putting my hope and trust in were my real gods, the things I was living in worship of, and that these things would always let me down um, make, and make me a slave to them. I saw that God didn't want my cheap, uh, hypocritical religion on the side of my life while I was then free to carry on with the things I really wanted. Uh, he was letting me know that he won't be satisfied until he has every last part of me. Um, and I won't, I won't be satisfied until I give every last part of myself to him as he's given himself for me fully in Jesus. Uh, following this realization, um, with the help of some books by Timothy Keller, I was helped to understand that God did, primarily didn't want a performance out of me, uh, but he wanted me to come for him just for himself, seeking a relationship with him, just as he's been seeking after me every day of my life. So I started to look at prayer different, differently, just as, he, um, as, as a way that God has to give me every good thing that he wants to give me. Um, and through prayer and a prayerful reading of God's word, the Holy Spirit is gradually making more real to me what Jesus has done and is making me like him, altering my will and all sorts of thoughts and attitudes and desires. Reading my Bible turned from an intellectual duty to a way to hear the words of my God who speaks uh, and to learn how to speak to him back. And I know God is just beginning this work in me as long as I keep coming to him for it, looking to Jesus. And in Jesus, I know I no longer need to be a slave to my guilt or sin and to my own achievements, um, to what others think of me, or even to what I think of myself. Um, but I can finally be free and I can know a peace and rest that go beyond all understanding and that I was, I was made to know. Uh, so today I'm getting baptized to declare with you all here at Brunsfield uh, and with all of Christ's church on earth and in heaven uh, that the saving work in my life that I'm so desperately in need of uh, but can never do myself uh, has been completely finished once and for all uh, by Jesus, God with us. Thank you. Wow, many thanks, Jacksons. How wonderful to hear your story. We can see you're ready, and so we're going to get things ready up here while we sing our next song. And after Jackson rises up out of the tank, let's give him an even warmer round of applause, after which we'll launch straight back into the final verse of the song that we're just about to sing.
Please have a seat, everyone. Good morning, my name's Ian, and I'm going to be doing the speaking, and Luca's going to be doing the baptising in these COVID-cautious times. We're delighted that Jackson is being baptised. What we're doing now really just symbolises what he's already talked to us about, his faith in the Lord Jesus, uh, the fact that he wants to serve Jesus as his Lord. Uh, and as Peter explained, as he goes down into the waters, that symbolises being buried with the Lord Jesus. As he comes out again, that symbolises the new life that he has in Jesus. So Jackson, really please you may have tired. I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, the answer is either I do or I will to each of them. So first question, do you believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you confess the risen Lord Jesus as your Saviour and King? I do. Will you seek to turn from your sin, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after him? I will. With the help of the Holy Spirit, do you offer your life in the service of God, wherever he may call you to go? I do. Having heard of your repentance and faith, we now baptise you, Jackson Tulin, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together. Good morning. Um, a little nervous to be the first person to stand on this again, but I think we're good. <laughs> um, I'm Danny. I'm a ministry trainee here at Brentsfield, and I'm just going to lead us in, in a little time of prayer. Um, God, we just thank you that we could all gather here on this beautiful morning, meeting together as a church um, and getting to celebrate Jackson's baptism. God, we thank you for the way you've been working in his life and for the, the encouragement it's been to us just to hear that testimony. We want to pray for him, that you'd continue working in his life and drawing him closer to you. And we pray that he'd be a powerful witness to your goodness. Um, and we ask that we'd be a helpful and edifying spiritual family for him as well. <clears throat> and God, on Mother's Day, we just want to pray especially um, for our mothers, both those of biological children, um, and just the women in our church that mother us in all sorts of ways that care for us and look after us, God. We thank you for them. Um, 
We also want to thank you <coughs> sorry, for the start of Burmier, um SU group. We thank you for the way you've answered prayers there and opened up a way for us to visit. Um, and we pray that that group would be a blessing to the school, that it would be fun for the students, but also that they'd have a chance to hear really clearly who you are. Um, and God, we, we recognize that we are living in a fairly peaceful time, but our hearts are really hurting for places where there is so much suffering and persecution and war. Our minds turn to places like Ukraine and Ethiopia and Afghanistan and, and many others. And we turn to you because we know that you hear our prayers and we know that you hate injustice. And we just ask for peace. We ask for you to strengthen your church in those places. And we pray that you would comfort your people in whatever circumstances uh, with the truth that you're with us and that ultimately you'll bring justice and right all these wrongs. We want to pray as well just for people in our congregation that are going through hard times, whether that's physical health or mental health or um, financial struggles. God, you know all our situations, and we thank you again that you're with us. Um, and finally, God, we just recognize that Easter is coming up, and we have so many exciting um, events and outreaches. God, we just want to pray that um, in all the business, you'd help us to reflect well on what you did for us. We want to pray that this would be um, a time when we get to have really good conversations with our friends and families, God. Um, and we want to pray that you'd just be speaking to people in our city um, through all that's going on this Easter. We want to pray that there'd just be a really good witness for who you are and what you've done, God. Um, we pray this all in your name. Amen. My name is David and I'm a member here and uh, it's my privilege to give the reading uh, today. The reading for today is in Acts chapter 13 and we're reading verses 13 to 52. That's on page 1107 in the Pew Bibles, page 1107. <clears throat> From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel <coughs> chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you're looking for. But there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. 
The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he would never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you holy and sure blessings, promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust of their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And the Lord will bless the reading of his word. I'll just pray for Graham just before he comes. Our Father, we just thank you for the amazing character of your word. And we just ask that you might just be with Graham as he comes just to open it up to, to us. Just grant him the power in his words. And just prepare each the heart of each one who hears, Lord, that your word might just come into the heart. Build us up, edify us. And change us. And if there's any who don't know you, that they may indeed be come to know you today. We just ask this, Lord. Thank you in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, so lovely to see you. Jackson, buddy. There. There he is. Thank you. And uh, on behalf of us all, know how encouraging that was for all of us to hear what God's done in your life uh, and know how humbling it was for me because I almost feel like I could standing up here and saying kind of, yeah, what he said. Um, but we're going to get into Acts 13. Here's what I want you to do, or I want to do rather. I want to make a beeline with your Bibles open. And I want to show you the one word that's right at the heart of our passage today. And it's 
the one word I think that's one of the most important in all of the Bible. And so to get this one word is to get the good news that's at the heart of Christianity. You'll see it in verse 39 if you come with me. Justified. Big words. Let me break it down for us, okay? And here's why whoever you are here today, all of us should care about this word. Because it's a word that transports us to the very courtroom of our creator. And it's a word that pronounces that guilty human beings like us can be forgiven and be made right with the God who made us. That's what it is to be justified. It's to be pronounced right with him. And so the question we've got to ask is, how do we get justified? Right? Here's how I used to think it worked. See if this connects. My little girl, Grace, and I, we went to the Commonwealth Pool a few months ago. It's a Tuesday afternoon. We've got 20 minutes to kill before her swimming lesson starts. And so we go at the stand, which you can see in the picture there, and we start watching what's going on, in her words, in the big pool. Okay, so we're watching the big pool. And as it turns out, on a Tuesday afternoon, the Scottish dive, highboard diving team are doing their thing. Okay, apparently they do this every Tuesday afternoon. The two of us are watching this, and we're absolutely gripped by it. So we watch them all go up one by one. We watch them go up and up and up, depending how brave they are. You can see the height of it. Watch them go up. And then we watched them come down. And we'd watch as every single one of them would hit the water. We'd watch as every single one of them would make the splash and resurface again. We'd watch as every single one of them would make the splash, rise and take off their goggles. And we'd watch as every single one of them would do that process and look in the one place, the same place. Do you know where they were looking? They were looking at the judges. Right? And the judges were there. They would hold up the scores. They would look at one another, give each other a nod. Seven, eight, six. One dude got a three, which I thought was brutal. (laughs) But what are they longing to see? They're longing to see the perfect 10. It's what they live for. It's what they do. Looking at the judge. Tell me I was good enough. Tell me I made it. Tell me I earned it. Seeing the score and that demoralizing feeling that they hadn't hit it. Do you know what? That's exactly how I used to think it worked with God the Creator. It's one of the ways the Bible describes sin in our human hearts, falling short of the holiness of this God. I was living my life asking the question, am I good enough? Trying to be a good person. Is he pleased with me? Maybe if I bring my religious A game, then he'll love me. But realizing then the state of my heart and my inability to obey and coming away devastated with that crushing feeling that I'm never going to measure up. Sound familiar? I think that's how we naturally think, isn't it, in our world that tells us that we need to work our way up to whatever it is we're trying to do. So I used to think this word justified, work, summing it up, if I achieved, then I would belong. It's exactly what Jackson was saying, wasn't it, in his story. Achieve to belong. Question, I wonder, how do you think it works here today? How do you think it works? Jay, while you're chewing on it, let me take you to this passage and these people in it. Let me show you how many of them think it works. Okay, so we're... We're back with Paul and Barnabas, verse 13. In the story of this book of Acts, which has been the story of the the growth of the early church, as Jesus, the risen Jesus, continues to move in the world. Paul and Barnabas, verse 13, they've sailed from Cyprus and they've landed in this place called Perga. So in terms of geography, where we are now, you can think of it as like modern day Turkey. Right? And from there, when they land in Perga, they make their way inland to this city called Pisidian Antioch. So in terms of geography of modern-day Turkey, in terms of biblical history, we've now stepped into the region in this day that's known as Galatia. 
And so in terms of understanding our Bibles and how they're put together, we've got to understand that this is the background for the book in our Bibles called Galatians. And you'll, you'll see a lot of the themes that are coming up this morning, you'll track with them as Paul writes his letter to the people who become Christians in this region. And so even though this is a Gentile place, Pisidian Antioch, Gentile, i.e. non-Jewish, it's a non-Jewish city, do you see in the text how they find their way? They make their way to a local synagogue, right? So this is just a place where the local Jews, they meet. And you kind of get a flavor here of what goes on on the Sabbath when they meet together. They, they read from the Old Testament. You see it? Verse 15, chapter 13, they read from the Old Testament. And then what they likely do is they just invite someone to bring some thoughts. Okay? So, so how do these people think that they are justified? Verse 39, by keeping the law of Moses, right? You can read there the keeping of the Ten Commandments and all the additional laws which kind of orbit round about. So to a Jewish mind, to behave is to be a, a sign, a sure way of knowing that you are within the circle of God's grace, that's how they think they are justified, the keeping of the law of Moses. And from how they think it works, here's how Paul has come to see that it works. So this is my, think back to the diving board. I thought, I wonder if you think this morning, the key word is achieve. People in this passage, what do they think the key word is? Behave. Paul says, believe. Believe. Now before we think he's gone all Oprah Winfrey on us, right? Student motivational po poster. See the crux of his message at verse 38. How can you and I be right with God? How can any human being be right with a holy God one way? Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, two of the most sweetest words I think we can hope to ever hear, through Jesus, not through you, not by trying harder, not by doing things, through Jesus. Let those words just wash over you this morning. Through Jesus as the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses, through Jesus. Do you remember one thing from this? Probably remember the diving board, right? But remember this, through Jesus, through him. So here's a guy who's the top of the class Jew, that's Paul, whose moral record, whose upstanding and active religious life would put all of us to shame, would take all of us to task, take all of us to town and back again. And yet what he is, has he come to see? This is not how he would get right with God. This is not how any of us will get right with God. He was a man in the first century whose words were echoed by Mumford and Sons in the 21st century, writing, singing, it seems that all my bridges have been burnt, but you say that's exactly how this grace thing works. You see, grace, the message of grace, is about to hit Galatia. How are we justified? One way, through faith in this Jesus. I love verse 15. What they say, brothers, if any of you has anything to say, please speak. Now, you're a preacher. This is a free hit. This is an open goal. This is a gift horse in the mouth. You can pick your phrase. And you kind of think, oh, I bet you kind of wish you hadn't asked that for Paul. Paul, do you want to say something? What does he say? Give me the mic, right? Three stops in his sermon. And this is Paul's first ever sermon on Gentile soul. I think that's why it's quite significant here. It's almost as if Luke at this point in the narrative is saying, this is the sermon. This is the message that did the rounds in Galatia. This is what Paul was saying. It's significant. And it's almost as if he invites all those who are in the synagogue listening in to take their seats as he takes them on an open bus tour of the Bible story, right? You, you don't want to ever done one of those things in Edinburgh? 
open bus tour, you sit there, what does the tour guide do? Just takes you through the stops. Here's what you see. Right, here's what's going on. Paul's first ever sermon. The sign above the first stop reads promise. Verse 23, come with me, promise. You see, right at the beginning of the Bible story, Adam and Eve, they sin in the Garden of Eden. They disobey God's word. It's almost as if you could read there that they become unjustified in this God's sight. Death and sin reigns among humanity. But God makes a promise right there in Genesis 3. Out of an overflow of who he is, stemming from his perfect justice and love, he makes a promise, he commits himself that he will not leave his people in that predicament. He will send a savior. And Israel's story as God rescues them and chooses them for himself is the story of how through the ages, through them, God has raised up a savior for his people, right? The one who will usher in God's blessing, not just for the Jews who will believe, but for anyone, around, um, anyone in the world who believes. God makes a promise. And the bus moves on. The sign above stop number two reads fulfilled. Right? Verse 27. What God, and this is great, by the way, when I hear, when I say verses and your heads go down, love it. Love it. Verse 27. Fulfilled. Paul's saying what God said he would do, the promise he made, he's carried it out. He's done it. He's done it. You're still waiting on it, but I'm telling you, he's done it. What God said he would do, he's done it. The promise you see is it waves, weaves its way through the Old Testament. It's almost as if at this point in time when Jesus comes, when Jesus dies, when Jesus rises, he steps into the shoes of that promise. He is the fulfillment of everything that God said he would do. And Paul is saying, you know that story, you know the, the Old Testament that you read every week in this synagogue, do you see, will you see, I'm pleading that you will see that this story has been leading up to the coming of Jesus and his death and his resurrection. I've got a weird obsession with at the minute on social media. Domino rallies. You ever watch a domino rally? Love those things. It just peels my sense of order and fulfill. You know what happens? You're just watching it and one person at the top is just flicking the first domino and it just goes round and round and round and round and round. It's kind of like, if you remember, um, what was that program called? Mousetrap, that program. That board game called Mousetrap, if some of you remember that. It's that kind of thing, isn't it? This order, this is leading somewhere. Someone flicks the first one, you watch the whole thing topple over. I think that's what kind of what Paul's saying here. Once you realize who Jesus is, once you've savored his grace, once you've seen him in action, the Old Testament story, reading it, becomes like watching one big domino rally. The promise, Jesus. Tracing God's promise all the way through and realizing that it was climaxing the fulfillment in him. Though he was innocent, here's what Paul's saying. Though he was innocent, verse 28, he was crucified on a cross. The lawkeeper died in the place of law breakers. And though he was verifiably dead, he was taken down from that cross, put in a tomb, and God raised him, verifiably dead, verifiably alive through the eyewitnesses. And you see that word raised, it appears four times in quick succession in the text there. Paul underscoring the fact that Jesus was raised. Jesus was raised. Jesus was raised. He was raised. God's way of showing the world that the price has been paid, that Jesus' mission has happened. It's like, kind of like we had the experience of the night, going to a, a restaurant, Alex and I, uh, coming to pay with our card, because who carries cash anymore? But you get that weird thing, don't you, where you scan your card, and it's not instant. It takes about five seconds, doesn't it, before putting your card in and the receipt coming out. You have that awkward five seconds where um, the waiter's looking at you thinking, are you trying to pull a fast one? And you're not, but you have to wait until the receipt. And that's what the resurrection is, the receipt that shows what Jesus did on the cross, the price of our sin that he took, the price of our past, present, future sins has been paid. 
it's gone through. And having raised him, fulfilling everything that, that Psalm 2 is talking about, and that's why Paul quotes it there at verse 32, God seated him at the position of all power and authority in the place of power and said, that's my son, that's my king, and I have put him, in the words of Psalm 2, I have put him on my holy hill. And nothing is toppling him from that throne because what he did, who he is, he accomplished it. That's my king. You see, God's view of Jesus. You want to know what it is? Look at the resurrection. That's my son. That's him. That's what he did. Sign above stop three reads proclaimed. Verse 38. Really quickly, Paul's just saying this news, the promise, the fulfillment, who Jesus is, this is the message that's going global. Come and take it. Come and live in it. This is what Jesus has done for you. What you could not do on your own, Jesus has done. There's three stops in the sermon. Luke tells us there's two reactions to his sermon. Verse 44, a, a week goes by, do you see in the text, since Paul went public with this message. I take it what he was, um, what he was saying, remember this is in the synagogue, he says, I take it what he was saying is doing the rounds now in Pisidia and Antioch, right? Growing up in Glasgow, we had this phrase, kind of talk of the steamy. People working in steam rooms and just it was the gossip mill and word got around really quickly. I think this is the kind of thing going on here, talk of the office, that kind of thing. The whole city gathered to hear it the next Sabbath, do you see? Which I take it is Luke's hyperbolic way of saying, do you know what? It felt like everyone was there. Everyone was there. Why were they there? They were there to hear the word of the Lord. And that's what you need, whoever you are here today, this is what you need. You need to hear the word of the Lord, okay? Do you see how Luke pulls out to the word of the Lord? He pulls out two reactions. Now, all the way through Acts, we've seen hunger and hostility. We've seen riot and revival. It goes slightly deeper here to the heart level of what's going on. Captured by the two J's in this passage. Here's the first one, verse 45. Jealousy. And it comes from the Jews as they see what God is doing through Paul. As they see that people are actually believing this stuff. How does that manifest itself? They heaped abuse, not just on the message, but on the messenger. And verse 50, they stir up people to riot against Paul and Barnabas. And they expel them from the city. It just means they booted them out, I think. Jealousy in the heart. I want what you've got. I don't like what you're getting. It's a hideous thing in the human heart. And it will eat us alive if we let it live in there. Jealousy. Contrasted with the other G. Verse 52. I take it the overflow of a heart that's greeted the news of this Jesus Oh, what he's done for us? Joy. Which is, I take it, the settled state of a soul that regardless of whether we're in one of those hard seasons of life, and listen, I know Mother's Day today for many of us here is not easy. Many, many levels. The pain you might feel about your mom who you've lost, the pain, Fraser said, you might feel that mother you're estranged from, all sorts of reasons that today could be in incredibly painful. The hard seasons of life where we can't bring ourselves to get out of bed in the morning, feeling the weight of the world in our shoulders, or whether we're in one of those high seasons of life where there's a spring in our step. I take it joy in the heart of someone who's responded to this message of Jesus is a settled state of the soul which delights in the truth that whether I'm in a great place or a hard place, because of who Jesus is and because of where Jesus is for me, 
It's a joy that no one can snatch away. You know, one of my favorite things to do, favorite things is to read the Gospels. And if you haven't done that today, get in there. Get in there. Meet this Jesus. To read about him in the Gospels. To see his heart for people. And to say to myself, that Jesus is still the same for me. And I'm adopted into God's family, not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done for me. And in light of that, I take it the Holy Spirit that Luke tells us accompanied this joy, the work of the Spirit in the child of God that says, births in us that desire that wants to say, because of what he's done for me, I want to give my all to him. I want to worship him. I want to live for him. It's exactly what Jackson was saying this morning, wasn't it? That's grace. And, and I take it that who brings knowledge of that is the Holy Spirit. Do you know what I've never seen before this week? If you want to get into Galatians, the letter of Galatians at the end. What, where did Paul end in chapter five? The fruit of the Spirit. How will you know when it is the fruit of the flesh, our earthly desires, our worldly desires? How will you know the Holy Spirit's at work in our lives? What are the two things that he contrasts in the list? The work of the flesh, jealousy. And yet the work of the Spirit, joy. And from two reactions to his sermon, let me just bring it home with one plea from his sermon. Verse 43, what do they say to those who did believe? They talked with them and urged them to continue, not trying harder, to continue in the grace of God. So Jackson, buddy, got you there. Never move on from this grace. Who this Jesus is. Don't be thinking like the divers at the Commonwealth Pool, that your relationship with your creator is somehow dependent, conditional on what you can achieve, how you're performing. That your relationship with creator is conditional. Did I get it right? Did I do enough? Never go back to the Old Testament law thinking that somehow if you could bring your religious A game, if I follow the rules, I'm in the good books of this God. Know that in Jesus, it's not about your achievements. It's not about your behavior. Know that in Jesus, the Jesus who's loved you since before you were born, the Jesus, and you can take it straight out of this passage, the Father who appointed you for eternal life, verse 48. This Jesus has died for you, and in him you are justified. You are adopted by this heavenly Father. And so never move on from this grace. And do you know what? I'm finished with this. This Jesus, what is he never going to see? He's never going to see decay. He will always be this Jesus for us. And no one's going to topple him for his throne. This holy one, God's holy one, will never see decay. You know, I love his my favorite stories I heard this week. And we'll finish with this. But a man called David Hume. Okay, David Hume was one of Scotland's leading humanist thinkers. He was... Um, active during the Enlightenment uh, era in our, I guess it was the West, but in our country in particular, skeptical about the things of God, confident that given enough time, belief in any kind of God would just fizzle out. And you know, he died in a house in Edinburgh in the year 1776. And it's widely believed that 30 or so years later, in that precise house where David Hume died, that the Scottish Bible Society, an organization that has as its very aim uh, to get the word of God out there across the world. Same house, Scottish Bible Society had its first ever meeting. Why? Because this Jesus is never going to see decay. And he's risen and he's ruling and he's reigning. And no one's going to topple him from his throne. He's building his church and God has said that this king the king who's loved you, the king who's known you before the foundation of the world, this king will live forever. It's exactly what Jackson said, wasn't it? We've heard the testimony of someone 2,000 or so years later after this was written. We've heard, verse 52, the testimony of a disciple who's filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. You know, there's some sermons that you finish, you're aware that you're writing, and you're very aware that it's about what we should do, how we should respond. This sermon today, I take it, should leave us just in awe of who Jesus is, what he's done for us.
So here's what I want to do in the kind of going with the grain of what we've looked at this morning. One is just to take a minute. Whoever you are here today, however you respond to this word this morning, why don't you just take a minute and take stock of who Jesus is and then we'll wrap up our time together. Why don't we do that and then we'll pray. So Paul would write in the letter of the Galatians, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And so Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Jesus who loved us and who gave himself for us. And I pray that your Holy Spirit moving amongst us today would bring a fresh realization of that truth to our hearts, to those who are doubting, to those who are hurting, to those who are scarred, to those who are feeling weighed down by their sin. May a fresh knowledge of this Jesus come to our hearts and to our minds. Father, I pray we thank you for this morning, for the celebration of the life that Jesus gives. Be with us now, Heavenly Father, as we close our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're just going to respond uh, in worship, just singing together. Band are going to lead us in singing just a couple of songs, celebrating who this Jesus is. As we're just going to start by singing about Jesus, hope of the nation. So why don't you stand and... I'll let the the guys lead us and then Fraser will come back and close. Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of so on earth, Jesus, light in the darkness, Jesus, truth in each circumstance, you are the source of heaven's light.
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Many thanks to everyone involved in the service, including those at the back of the room, looking after the visuals, audio, and the live stream. As ever, please let us know if you have any questions or would like us to pray with you. If you're online, you can do that by using the email address under the video box. The last words are from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen, and have a good afternoon.